Hello and welcome to interest.co.nz. I'm Gareth Vaughan with another of our Double Shot interviews and I'm joined by Simon McCarley who's the acting CEO of the Serious Fraud Office. Welcome in Simon, thanks for coming in again. Um, look, I just thought I'd, I'd kick off by asking you um, where things are at with your finance company cases. Um, we know that uh, you're getting towards the end of them. Um, how many are still, are still live? Well, we've completed the investigation of 15 of them, which is the total number that we uh, put to investigation. Um, of those, we put nine to prosecution. Um, we've had outcomes now in eight of those, um, but we still have three uh, prosecutions ongoing. So we've got remaining defendants in two of those cases, and of course the the, the major case, which is South Canterbury Finance, is, uh, is due to go to trial in March next year. Okay. Um, and the other ones, you, I think, uh, Belgrave and, and, and Rockford? Are Belgrave still... and Rockford also also have uh, remaining defendants to be tried. Um, Rockfort should go to trial uh, at the beginning of next week. Uh, the trial is set down to commence and uh, Belgrave, the last defendant, will be uh, at trial some stage in the coming year. So getting towards the end now, it's been a lot, well, it's been a, a, a busy process running over the last few years. Um, you made some recent comments in a, in a press release that the SFO was, was now committed to ensuring any future threat to the economy equivalent to, to that of the finance company collapses would be coordinated and effective and uh, you were moving to address threats proactively through intelligence-led detection and interagency cooperation, fighting economic crime together to deter future offending and reduce the consequences. I thought they were quite sort of big, bold, interesting comments. I, I'm just wondering... Um, what, I guess, has the SFO and, and to, to, to some extent the other regulators learnt from this process and, and, and how are you doing things differently now if you are? Well, I think what we've learned at the SFO is that the, the key to minimising the impact of financial crime on the economy and on the participants in the economy, being everyday uh, members of the New Zealand public, uh, is early intervention. Um, to catch the crime before it becomes a major issue. Um, and that was echoed by Harry Markopoulos, the, uh, the whistleblower from uh, the Madoff uh, uh, Ponzi scheme uh, in the US when he was out here in February uh, speaking at our, at our financial crime conference, uh, where he made the clear indication that it's much better to catch a $4 million Ponzi scheme than a $40 billion Ponzi scheme. And it's about the timing, and it's about the way you... Um, you use intelligence to identify those schemes. Um, and so we've adopted that approach in our overall strategy, uh, moving to look more at intelligence-led detection, moving to look at encouraging whistleblowers to come forwards, and moving to try and build and do some work around business ethics to encourage reporting. Um, we've uh, seen some results to date around that. Um, a couple of the re more recent cases we brought to prosecution have been the result of early, early reporting, but we think there's a lot more we can do there. Um, and so essentially well, we want to make sure we don't repeat the lessons of the past. How can you detect this type of fraud, I mean any type of fraud I guess, earlier? Well, I mean, what do you need to... The detection process is, is twofold. The first is reporting um, and we need to work hard on encouraging people to come to us early in the piece when they have suspicions. Um, and we need to be better at, at supporting those people and supporting them through the process. Um, a good example of when that happened was in the Data South case, which was quite a large fraud when it was reported. But it only came to our attention because we had a whistleblower in the organisation who had the courage to come forward and report that and get involved. Now that had some quite severe personal consequences for her, not only did she lose her job because of the collapse of the company, but uh, she also lost her own personal investment in, in that organisation or, or alongside that organisation. So there are costs involved and we need to be able to um, support those people in making that very difficult decision that they make. So basically, I mean, your message to people if they are inside a company or they have knowledge of things going on that are probably fraud, then they should come forward? And Even if they have a suspicion um, from within the company, from without the outside the company, as a competitor, 
um, the information all adds up. Um, small pieces of information which to one person might not seem that significant, when aggregated with other information we're, we're getting, can give us the lead we need to make that early intervention. Yep, sorry. The other, the other part, obviously, of early intervention is um, the proactive intelligence. And in that respect, we're looking at working with other agencies and with some private sector people um, to start some analysis, uh, some data analysis, to look at patterns um, and see if we can see where the next offending is might come from and see if we can identify anomalies in that data which would point to offending. And, and is that a matter of picking a sector or an industry and saying, let's have a look at what's going on here? Or, or is it a matter of starting from a position where you have some suspicions or perhaps some leads about a company or an industry well, and it, taking it from it's there? It's a matter of picking a sector, but that process of picking the sector will be driven by a gut feeling or some unsubstantiated rumour or... I mean, the same sort of rumour that, that was in the market when the finance companies were teetering, um, there was a lot of talk around what was going on inside them. Now, if we'd applied a, an intelligence-led approach at that point, um, and if that had worked across all the regulatory agencies, we may well have been able to intervene at a much earlier point. How, how much earlier do you think? I mean, um, Well, I mean, I was in private practice at the time. Um, as early as 2001, 2002, there were mentions that all was not right with some of these finance companies. Um, what we want to do is to be at that position, not necessarily conclusively drawing any conclusions, but, but being able to get together with our sector partners, with the FMA, with other organisations, and, and say, look, we need to have a close look at this. We need to keep an eye on what's, what's happening in development. So and I think we're well paced to do that. Both the FMA and ourselves have invested quite heavily in that intelligence part of the, uh, the equation. So uh, we will on the way to it, but um, it's something we can keep working on. So if, if authorities such as the SFO, the, I guess, Securities Commission back then, had, had had, I guess, better information, maybe some whistleblowers as early as 2001, 2002, you think there could have been some intervention on finance companies that ultimately... I mean, we can't, with any certainty or say what might have been in a, in a different world, but we definitely think that if that situation were to reoccur or a similar situation were to occur, we'd be much better equipped to address it now and we'd be much earlier into the uh, into process of intervention. Now, obviously, um, I guess uh, more recently, since the finance company collapses, we've had Ross Asset Management. Um, now, obviously, David Ross has, has pleaded guilty and we await the result of... of what sentence he's going to get. Um, but in a, in a case like that, that I guess was not well known to most people in New Zealand, but obviously, you know, there were investors there for many years with him um, before things came, it came to light that exactly how bad it was. Um, in that sort of situation, is that the type of situation where you really need someone to blow the whistle? An investor, perhaps? Um. Or is that one that you think authorities could detect earlier too? I mean, obviously, it's, it's, he, he got an AFA licence through the FMA. I mean, that's one issue. But, but in terms of, you know, could, could that one have been again? Detected it's early? difficult to say. I mean, hindsight, you can say this and that, and the other thing should have should have been done. Um, I mean, what surprises me about the Ross Asset Management case is how little was known about his business when it was so so large compared to the his. To the other people of the same sole investment advisor businesses in in the sector, um, I knew nothing about it. I'd been in practice and working in that sector, and I'd never come across um, his Ross Asset Management as a as a fund manager or as an advisor. Um, it was completely under the radar as far as as I was aware. Um, it certainly, and a, a whistleblower would have assisted. But I'm just not sure that too many people were aware of what was going on in the, mm. in the operation. And now, as you sit here today, um, are there any particular areas or industries or sectors um, of the economy that you are closely monitoring where you have concerns that, I guess, new endemics of fraud could break out? Um, we have 
obviously now we've come to an end with the finance company investigations and also I'd add with a, a series of investment advisor um, Ponzi type scheme investigations and prosecutions. Many of those are, are still ongoing as well and uh, will need to be supported. But as we come to the end of those investigations, we've sat down and had a, a look at how SFO can best address emerging issues. Um, intelligence lead detection is one of those, um, and the other is working more closely and using our expertise and our, our relatively rare and expensive forensic accounting skills, we hold, um, to assist the frontline financial crime agencies. There's a whole range of agencies in our economy who have a frontline um, role in looking at financial crime. SFO is, is reserved for serious and complex crime and when we take on a case that's the standard it, it needs to meet. But that doesn't mean we can't make our expertise available to those frontline agencies. And it's from that process that we've gone we've worked on and we're talking to those agencies, looking at areas in which we think there may be emerging or evolving issues. Um, and we've recently announced um, joint investigations with Commerce Commission in relation to pro forma invoicing, where uh, we have completed an investigation and have laid some charges. Uh, we've looked at uh, gaming, the gaming industry, and we've worked with DIA on an investigation which is well advanced, and uh, hopefully we'll be bringing that to a conclusion in the next uh, six to six or so months. Um, so those are the areas where we're trying to say, well, let's work across all the agencies and identify those emerging risks, not as they emerge as serious and complex offending, but as they emerge as frontline offending. And Christchurch is a good example of that. Um, we've taken on a couple of Christchurch cases and hopefully we'll have some resolutions to those shortly. Um, but we've also been working closely with a lot of the other agencies in Christchurch, with the Commerce Commission, with Sarah, with the insurers, with the police obviously, um, on the whole range of crime and have been talking actively and regularly about where we're seeing things coming up. Um, and to that extent we're able to support an early frontline response rather than even getting into the serious and complex range. So what you're talking about here I guess is rather than being an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, you want to get up to the top of that cliff and be there to nip things in the bud. Um, well, I think our core responsibility will always be the last resort. I mean, we will always be the last resort of serious criminal prosecution. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the resource we hold internally can't be applied across the spectrum to stop things getting to that point. And what we're looking at is a, what we call a centre of excellence model, where we have our people devoted to our core detection, investigation and prosecution function, but also make them available to other agencies to use upstream of that um, so that we can enhance their regulatory uh, effectiveness as well as maintaining that backstop, that end response, which is serious criminal prosecution. Now, you're obviously going to have a new CEO come in on the 21st of October, um, Julie Reid. Can you tell me, uh, I guess, can I ask um, whether you um, ha had applied for the job permanently and, um, and um, if not, what you're going to be doing next? And also, what sort of caseload is, is, is Julie Reid going to be inheriting? Um, well, as, as for myself, I mean, it's, I don't see it as terribly relevant to the SFO, but I mean, I have been the acting CE for almost a year. Um, when I took that role on, I think I had probably done everything I needed to do in my previous general manager role. I, I went there to sort out finance companies. Um, that is, a, is almost at an end. Um, I had applied for the job. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't successful, but um, that is just the way of, way of the world. Um, so I'll be looking, moving on from the organisation at some stage once the transition is completed. Uh, as far as workload, um, the workload remains relatively steady. Uh, we're sitting at our targets on new cases open. The nature of it... Can you just remind us what the targets are? Um, we have a KPI around getting 30 to 40 new cases open every year and we're just about on target for that in, in this year. We fell a bit, little short last year. Uh, that's really because some of the cases are more resource intensive mm. than others. 
um, and having taken on those two very large joint operations, that probably in fact reflected two very large and complex cases that um, would have otherwise been a number of other investigations. So the workload's pretty much steady. The number of complaints is running at, uh, at its usual standard level. Um, the nature of what we're doing has changed slightly. We don't have so many new financial markets cases coming in. Uh, we have a heavy uh, workload around bribery and corruption at the moment. Um, we've recently announced a, uh, a prosecution in relation to a publicly listed company um, and its CE. Uh, we've got an, a, another couple we can't unfortunately disclose yet in the, in the, in the pipeline, but um, that's been a focus for us. Uh, and we're obviously moving resource as we can uh, into both the intelligence lead detection and into the outreach to other agencies. Bribery and corruption is an interesting area because in the international surveys New Zealand always comes out you know, as being one of the least corrupt countries, but um, clearly we have bribery and corruption in New Zealand. Um, what level of it are you, are you seeing or do you believe might be out there? Um, I think we're getting a greater level of reporting. We're seeing an increasing number of complaints around it. Um, I'm not sure whether that indicates that there's a greater occurrence of bribery or corruption or just that awareness of it is, is coming up and therefore reporting is coming up. Um, we really need, I mean, there really needs to be some more uh, research done if, if we were to make a conclusive call on that. Um, we do have a reputation for relatively low levels of bribery and corruption, and um, having talked with some of our international partner agencies, um, I think that's probably correct. I think we probably do have a lower levels in some of the economies we trade with. But I think that's a key point, is that as our trading partners move from um, the countries with traditionally lower levels of corruption into those which have struggled with the issue, uh, the more emerging economies, we need to be sure that we are maintaining a resistance. Um, and I think that may be part of the increased awareness we're seeing as people are, are now becoming aware of it because we're now trading with and working a lot more closely with a lot more of those less highly ranked economies. Well, thanks a lot for that, Simon. That's Simon McCallie, who's the acting CEO of the Serious Fraud Office. And I'm Gareth Vaughan at interest.co.nz.